Hey friends, this is Jim here with Science Talk. Well, under the category of dubious accomplishments, CO2 levels are now at the highest than ever been in 3 million years. Let me state that again. CO2 levels are the highest than they have ever been in 3 million years. Not since the Pliocene. So, this is a, a report, a research that was published in the journal Science Advances. And the lead uh, principal investigator on this was Dr. Matteo Willeit of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, which is in uh, Germany. So, he and his team have confirmed that carbon dioxide is reaching concentrations unprecedented on any human time scale with CO2 levels in the atmosphere already higher than they have been for at least 3 million years, as I stated at the outset. Their computer simulations, backed up by analysis of ocean sediments that tell the story of the changing temperatures as well as the greenhouse gas level, show that before the centuries close, the world this century is closed, 21st century, the world will become warmer than at any time in the last 3 million years. I said, not since the Pliocene. Now, I have explained this to you before, but for those folks who haven't seen my previous videos, let me tell you what goes on with computer models. Because you often see, well, it's just models, you guys just making stuff up, and it's like throwing shit at a wall and see what sticks. No. What we do is we, we identify our parameters. We collect all the data of, that we have available for those parameters. We enter it into a huge database. In the meantime, we're also figuring out rates of change, we're figuring out the processes. So we're, we're solving differential equations of all complexities to create our mathematical modeling. We then run our models but we run our models so that we get results that can be verified. What do I mean by that? We get, we run the models and we look at the results. If the results match what, ha, what is already has been observed and on a consistently very high level, then we know we've got the model dialed in. Otherwise, we keep tweaking the model so that, and it might be, you know, you know, you know, a little adjustments to the equation, um, maybe an extra term or so, or remove a term, whatever it takes. There's some statistical analyses that check those things as you go along. But we, until we get a, uh, the model that predicts exactly what we have already observed, only then, do we then see, do we then run the projection as to what will happen in the future? We're not just saying, well, let's just toss in this level of this and let's throw in this and let's see what the hell happens. No. We've taken the data that we have, we use them, we make sure the models replicate what's already observed, and not just only the data, but the processes involved, the interactions, the trends, etc. Once we're confident with that, then we run them and, and say, well, okay, what the simulations will be? And granted, there are assumptions, and the assumptions are that things continue as they have already been going along. So we're making, using statistical confidence analyses and other techniques, we then project what, would, what, what will the measurements of these parameters be in the future. Program that in, see what the results are. So the models are, you know, we, we get the models precise. We get them to accurately predict, basically reconstruct what we already know has happened. Then we let it, uh, we let it run and see what the future may bring. So Dr. Willie Eat basically states that we are now pushing our home planet beyond any climatic conditions experienced during the entire current geological period, the Quaternary. That's, that's saying something. He 
goes on to say, the quantum there is a period that started almost 3 million years ago, saw a human civilization beginning only 11,000 years ago. So the modern change we see is big, really big, even by the standards of Earth's history. What is he saying there? The rate of change. Rate of change is nothing like we've seen before. So, in their report that was published in the journal Science Advances, he and his colleagues uh, report that they made a numerical model of all the astronomical and geological data available for the last few million years and fed in algorithms to represent the physics and chemistry of planet Earth. This is kind of what I was getting at when, we, when I mentioned about you know, putting in solving differential equations, putting in you know, algorithms is really just a, a recipe, if you will, as to how to do calculations. In essence, this is what it is. Now you're going to sit there, you're probably wondering, why are we talking, why aren't they looking at astronomical data? They had a simulation of a rocky planet complete with active volcanoes that emit carbon dioxide, perhaps uh, sulfur dioxide, along with their magma. As this planet goes around a star on a slowly changing elliptical orbit that subtly changes the levels of sunshine that reach the surface. Milankovitch. They were accounting for Milankovitch cycles. And I, I did that lengthy video for you on the Milankovitch cycles and how that affects long-term uh, climate cycles and you know, the various periodic shifts in the, the, the planetary climate. They also uh, put into the model data about sediments in high latitudes. This is important because ice sheets advance more easily over gravel than bedrock. Gravel gives way more readily. Atmospheric dust from such attrition makes ice surfaces darker, more vulnerable to melting. Darker, less albedo. The whiter the ice surface is, the more reflectance, the higher the albedo. The result, confirmation of one thing already observed and another much feared. And that's what I say. Models, we, we work the models until they replicate what we have already observed. Before we then say, okay, now what? What if? As you know, you know, the ratio, uh, the, the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere has gone from 280 parts per million to about 410 today. And basically, we can pinpoint this starting the industrial age. Now, this, they are uh, uh, asserting that a new ice age seems increasingly unlikely. And other researchers have already uh, indicated the Pliocene data as soon to be exceeded record, which has just now happened. It was close to it. Now, with the slowdown in the AMOC and the slowdown in the Gulf Stream, climate, an ice age can still happen. But we now know, thanks to this new study that I shared with you recently, we now know that even after the conveyor belt shuts down totally, May only take decades to do so, but there's enough thermal inertia, enough mechanical inertia, current flows, that kind of stuff, that there's a lag such that it would be on the order of centuries before the planet noticeably overall begins to cool down such to the point of ice sheets now growing. But what we're doing to the planet, instead of being maybe a three to four century lag, it might be five, maybe six centuries. Don't know. But it's possible, given all the in thermal inertia that has been put into the uh, system. Entirely different studies have shown the world to be on course to exceed the two degrees C limit. Well, we're, you know, the 
most people say, yeah, we're definitely at 1. A lot of studies saying 1.3. We're probably going to blow past 1.5 before the yeah, end of the, before the 2030. So, another 70 years, things keep going as is. We might not just only go past 2, we might go hit 3. Things keep going. The research confirms other findings and delivers a test of the reliability of evidence from the past. Basically it's saying this is a good model that they've developed. It also backs up the value of simulation as an increasingly reliable form of climate forecasting. So when people want to sit there and say, well, models are just full of shit, you can tell them, no, you're full of shit. You don't know what you're talking about. And you can, you can then play this tape, this video for them. Play this tape, yeah, right, it's like on VHF. You can play this video for them where I explain how models are, are created. So Dr. Williet basically states, we know from the analysis of sediments on the bottom of our seas about past ocean temperatures and ice volumes. And we are working to fully understand better how CO2 shapes the glacial cycles. It is a breakthrough that we can now show in computer simulations that changes in CO2 levels were a main driver of the ice ages, together with variations of how the Earth orbits around the Sun, the Milankovitch cycles. These are actually not just simulations. We compared our results with hard data from the deep sea, and they proved to be in good agreement. Our results imply a strong sensitivity of the Earth's system to relatively small changes in atmospheric CO2. As fascinating as this is, it is also worrying. I took to task, there was some online form, and this guy is basically saying that CO2 doesn't affect temperature. And he put down this graph of CO2 levels all over the place. And right underneath that, he had a graph of temperature. And he was very disingenuous about this because he was plotting them on the same scale. So, of course, the temperature looked like a flat line. No response. Now, anyone who is not, does not study this sort of stuff would kind of go, ooh, ooh, ooh he, he's, on, he's onto something there. I saw that, and I called out bullshit. And I called him out on it. And uh, it was interesting because at the same time, he's saying, well, the planet hasn't even warmed up, you know, not even the one degree that supposedly has already happened, and he included a, 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 a data that was in table form. I went through the, the, the data, went through every single entry there, and I then highlighted, I said, oh, by the way, dude, See this temperature here? See this temperature here? That's one degree difference. But the main thing that, you know, a lot of people are not going to take the time to, to read through a table of data. You know, I'm a nerdy scientist. That's what I do. <laughs> okay. But they're going to look at a graph. They're going to look at a graph. And they're going to see a CO2 doing this. And then they look underneath there and see temperature doing this. Flat line. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, he's right without critically thinking about it. And I basically said, you're full of shit. Okay? You are misrepresenting. I said, you did not, you deliberately chose the similar scales so that the sensitivity of the changes in temperature will not be seen. I said, try plotting them on two different axes, two different scales. You, you, can, you can do that. You can, you can have one scale you know, for the CO2, another scale for the temperature, Two different graphs and just put them on top of each other, one over the other, and look right at it directly. But he put them on the, on the same graph, to the same vertical axis scale. So of course you're not going to tease out the subtleties in the temperature. So that that's that's it being dishonest, to be quite blunt. So I called him out on it, and uh, he wasn't too happy. I told him to stop being a snowflake. Anyway, uh, I'm just, uh, I find myself being less and less patient 
with this sort of uh, rhetoric with stuff that I see people posting and they're thinking they're experts. I actually had one person call me arrogant and then he said, you refuse to listen to my alternative facts. Excuse me? Alternative facts equals lies, you butthead. And I basically told this person, I said, so what are your credentials? Have you gone to graduate school? Become an expert in this? Have you been out there in the field doing the hard research, doing the analyses? He said, let me tell you what arrogance is. Arrogance is when you think you know more than experts like me. Well, that is being arrogant. So, um, I said, yeah, I'm just becoming a cranky old, crotchety old man. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just finding myself less and less tolerant of, of this bullshit. And we're seeing it, study after study after study. There's been over 11,000 papers published in peer-reviewed journals. Only 37 state that what's happening is not due to human activity. Now, these 11,000 papers come from scientists from all over the world, from institutes all over the, the planet. So you're going to say that they're all in on this conspiracy? If you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. And by the way, a recent study, and I, and I did a video segment on this some, uh, some months ago, a, a, a recent survey of those 37 papers found major flaws in every single paper, be it a major flaw in the assumption, major flaw in the analysis, major flaws in the interpretation, what have you. But there were major flaws in each one of those 37 papers. And then when you corrected for those flaws, those papers all came in line with the other nearly 11,000 papers or so. That basically saying, humans are fucking things up. Excuse the French. <laughs> So, um, this is part of the problem. People are in denial. This also includes politicians who can make policies. All we can do as scientists is present our findings, make our recommendations as strongly as we can, but at the end of the day, we do not make policy. I had a friend of mine who, uh, she's an ecologist. She actually went back to school to get a law degree because she says, I need to understand how the legislature thinks. So that, and her goal is to help write legislation. Because, I'll give you an example, with, you know, a politician asking a scientist about something. So, can you state with absolute certainty that that's the case. And the scientists might reply, well, we have 95% confidence that that is the case. Of course, Paul thinks, what the hell does that mean? Well, we can say, 90, you know, due to random variations in any system, we can say 95 times out of 100, this will happen. What about the other 5%? Well, random variations. Can you state with 100% certainty? I can state with 95% certainty. And then the, the politicians will say, so you don't know. We're going to be right 95 out of 100 times. Sometimes 99 out of 100 times. No scientist worth their salt will ever say, I can state 100% certainty. Because if you understand anything about systems and the random variations inherent in the system, nothing is 100% certain. But politicians, everything is black and white to them. They do not understand nuance. And it's these chuckleheads that are making policies. Anyway, I think I've ranted on long enough here, but uh, now, now we're seeing, you know, we're just throwing more and more CO2 into the atmosphere, and as the ocean's ability to absorb the CO2 uh, lessens, the CO2 is going to even more rapidly build up in the atmosphere, in which case uh, we're screwed. 
The planet Earth will be fine. Humans are screwed. And the organisms will have to adapt. There will be some extinction. We are in the middle of sixth extinction. That have to, like every other major extinction event that planet Earth has uh, suffered through. You know, what did uh, Ian Malcolm from Jurassic uh, Park say? Nature finds a way. Nature does. Thank you for your time. Hey friends, this is Jim reminding you to subscribe and share my videos. Also, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I drop a video in. And I'm also asking to, for you to please support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your continued support.